All right, welcome to Discipleship Training. We are going to continue and wrap up our alternate lesson on does God approve of contraception in marriage. Um, so we had got about halfway through, and we stopped last week talking about God's purpose for marriage is to be a vehicle by which godly offspring are produced. And we're going to pick up from there today and continue on. So let's just recap really quickly. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 13 through 16 in the New King James Version. That's Malachi chapter 2 verses 13 through 16 in the New King James Version. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks, he being God, seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. Let's go back up to 15 and we just read the first half. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. So what we see here and what we're going to continue to talk about is that the Lord specifically designed marriage for godly offspring to be produced. And it is the prescribed way. It is the only way in which godly offspring can be produced through a heterosexual marriage between a man and a woman. So fornication nor adultery produces godly offspring. So babies born out of wedlock, that is not God's intended process. Not to saying that those children aren't a blessing, but God's process is for a two-parent married household between a heterosexual man and a heterosexual woman. All right, now, the reason why... For God, God's desire for godly offspring is because children are his inheritance. And we saw that in Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5. But we're going to continue talking about this because God's heritage or inheritance that he's trying to pass on from generation to generation is his character, his ways, his commandments. And then ultimately the eternal inheritance that we all receive if we endure to the end. That comes through godly offspring partially we know discipleship is about bringing people into that fold as well but as we talked about last week when a child is raised up in that and that's all they've ever known you are 10 xing your impact because a child can get started much earlier in their discipleship journey than someone who comes in on later and has a lot of baggage that the lord has to deal with right a lot of trauma, a lot of uh, ungodly worldviews. There's just so, so many things that you have to deal with when you come into Christ as an older babe in Christ versus a child. That's a clean slate. Okay, so let's go to Psalms 78, and we're going to read verses 5 through 7 in the easy-to-read version. That is Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7 in the easy-to-read version. He, being God, made an agreement with Jacob. He gave the law to Israel. He gave the commands to our ancestors. He told them to teach the law to their children. Then the next generation, even the children not yet born, would learn the law. And they would be able to teach it to their own children. So they would all trust in God, never forgetting what he had done and always obeying his commands. This is huge because we always talk about trust 
and faith operating together, right? And oftentimes, when you are not brought up in right teaching, you have to learn to trust the Lord. But when you are taught, and that's all you know, where it is a, it is a cultural thing, as it was with the Hebrews, to trust the Lord. It was embedded in their culture and their law. Now, they didn't always adhere to it, as we know, <laughs> through historical reading. But it's a whole lot easier to fall back and rely on that when that is all you know versus you spent the past 25, 30, 40, 50 so odd years walking by sight. And now you get converted and you have Tremiko and Donovan telling you, okay, now you got to walk by faith. What? <laughs> what is that? And that goes against <clears throat> this whole generation. Sorry. Everyone, this whole generation talking about you let your children choose their path in life. It's just like, how can they choose their child? So this just totally goes against the word of God. Yeah. And so what we're seeing, there's a scripture that I've read when I was studying for this uh, last week. I believe it's in Luke. I, I didn't write it down. I was, I was silly for not writing it down. But Christ is speaking to the Pharisees, and he, he literally says to the Pharisees, everything that the world admonishes is an abomination to God. Everything. So when we're talking about us, because what this gets down to and what we're going to get through today is birth control in any form of contraception is about autonomy. It is about independence from God. I am... I am deciding my fate, my will. And that is what society lifts up, especially in American culture. That is what society admonishes. That is what society is you're supposed to do. But scripture tells us that that in and of itself is an abomination to God. You got it from me? Yeah. I, I don't know the translation. New King James Version. I was reading New King James. Yeah, because I like that scripture. I think this is it, but... <laughs> This is random, Wait, but no, this is Miko, something you said to me think, you know, I used to be a teacher, um, yeah. and you said the worldview of, like, let them choose their own thing. There's literally a, um, I cannot think of the name of it for the life of me right now, but it's a form of learning that they're teaching now to kids. It's all about choice. Mm -hmm. Like, let them choose, let them have all these choices. And then, like, even deeper past that, it's, like, kind of like this narrative where it's, like, let them do what they want, and you can't tell them what to do. And, like, a lot of us were, like, that's not how we raise our own kids. But we had to do that as teachers for the other kids at school. And it was, it was really tough a lot of the time. But you're right. And they're teaching it really, really young. It comes from Alistair Crawley, um, do what thou will. So he's basically mm -hmm. changing commandments. And a lot of people that are Satanists, worshipers, um, Illuminati, a lot of people in the entertainment industry, that's where you saw Jay-Z had that shirt on, Do Without Will. That comes from Alistair Crowley. So it's teaching, basically, do whatever you want. Whatever you want is fine. Whatever you want to do is great. And that's sad that, that they're now starting to teach kids that. Because yeah. if Satan knows if he gets that in their mindset young, there's no way God can, will be yeah. able to get in. And this really comes into, like, I love to be good I just said that. Satan is fighting for our children. Satan has understood this from jump. Yep. And then we... And I include myself in that because, like I said, me and Nefertiri in our first six years of marriage, we were in disobedience. We plugged into that. Well, we're just going to wait to have children. Uh, maybe we'll have one or two. We'll see how we feel in a few years. The, and Satan, we are operating in his design, his strategic framework. That's exactly what I want. Because for Gather, Satan has always been attacking us because he knows our goal, our mission, our guiding light is we want to teach the accuracy in the full breadth of God's word. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I can't stop them from operating, but I can stop them from creating an inheritance from generation to generation by deception, by deceiving, by false worldviews that are contrary to scripture. And that is what the world is doing while Satan is ravaging from house to house, cultivating children into ungodly worldviews. Christians are is, is subscribing to the same thought process. All right, so Luke 16 and 15 in the New King James, New King James, James Version. And he said to them, this being Christ, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart. 
for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Very powerful. So anything that man saying highly esteems means we lift it up. That's something we should aspire to be. That's something that's really important. That's something that's really powerful. God is saying, that is an abomination in my sight. That disgusts me. And so when we're looking at this idea of choice, when it comes to contraception in marriage, when it comes to children, what the world is esteeming is to take control of your own fate. God is saying, that is an abomination to me. And that is the framework in which we have to operate by. Am I pleasing the Lord or am I disgusting, disgusting him by my choices and the things that I decide to operate in? All right, so now let's go to Psalms 119, verse 111 in the English Standard Version. And we're still talking about this heritage of God's character. Uh, so that's Psalm 119, verse 111 in the English Standard Version. And this is being spoken to God as praise. Your testimonies, so God's testimonies, are my heritage forever. For they are the joy of my heart. So God's testimonies, his commandments, his precepts, his will is a heritage forever. Going from generation to generation to generation. That is the purpose of godly offspring. Now, it doesn't stop there. So we see the purpose for marriage. God says, I want godly offspring. Why? So I can pass on my heritage, my commandments, my will, my precepts, my character. Scripture then goes on, and parents, your responsibility is to steward this process. So let's go to Proverbs 22 and 6 in the New King James Version. 22 and 6 in the New King James Version. That is Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 in the New King James Version. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is God's strategy. Satan just is just replicating it. <laughs> God is saying from jump, when that baby is born, train him or her up in me. And no matter what comes, and this is the thing people have to realize, this isn't about just taking them to church. This is what the Lord had to ta- teach me. This isn't about just they in church every Sunday. What he's saying is you train them up in righteousness. Train them up in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Then when they grow old, they will not depart from it. A lot of times when people say, oh, I grew up in the church, my parents took me to church every week. <laughs> but I had no religion and I had no relationship. Because a lot of people now, they're saying, like, I gave up religion for relationship. That is unbiblical. I don't know what you're talking about. Because religion is actually the study of God's things, of his commandments, of his will. That is the religion. And the relationship is with him. You got to have both. Like, people think so deep when they say that. And I'm just like, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Like, you a fool. <laughs> you are a fool. Because... <laughs> Because the religion is literally the doctrine <laughs> of Christ. That is the religion. <laughs> so, you, so what you're saying is you don't study scripture. Got it. Just say that. <laughs> Just say that. All right. So now let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29 in the New King James Version. Oh, that they had such a heart in them. That they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Let's add to that. So, same, uh, so Deuteronomy, let's go to chapter 6, verse 6 through 7. So that's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6 through 7 in the New King James Version. 6, 6 through 7. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. 
and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So not only will you teach them, this is going to be a routine discussion. You're going to take time to break down thoughts, answer questions. This is this should be table conversation. This should be pillow talk. This should be we going for a walk talk. Like this should engulf your life. It's training up your children in the ways of God, his heritage. All right, let's look at one more. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 29. And we're going to look at verse 17 in the Amplified Classic. That's Proverbs 29, verse 17 in the Amplified Classic. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your heart. That correction is based into the commandments, the precepts, and the teachings of God. That is where that correction is based into. And the Lord is telling us that is the process. I created this vehicle, marriage, the covenant, which is a reflection of my relationship with the church. Right? He, he didn't look to humans to make marriage. He looked to him on his own self and made marriage as a covenant between man and woman for the purpose of bringing in godly offspring so that he could pass on his heritage, being his precepts, his commandments, his character, And it is our job as parents to then shepherd and steward that process. This is exactly what Satan does. And he took it right out of God's playbook. And notice it says, correct your sons. And like Donovan said, it's in God's word and he will give you rest. So there's a lot of parents who their children have caused them to be in turmoil, to be in stressed out to be in agony, to not have any peace, because they're not teaching, they didn't teach their child the commandments of the Lord. And that child is not operating as that child grows up to a teenager and adult. They're not operating in God's word. So they have all of this stress and headache and heartache in their lives. Their children are either dead because they got caught up in something or in jail because they got caught up in something or live a very immoral lifestyle and it brings embarrassment to the whole family or whatever that, whatever that could be. Um, and it says, you know, if you train them up and correct them, he will give delight to your heart. So for those parents that raise their children to know the word of God, not just go to church, like Donovan said, do you actually know the scriptures? Do you know the word so that you can apply it to your life? Those are the children that grow up. And as their children and mature into adulthood, they're giving their parents peace. For those that weren't trained up in this and are not operating in that, you're basically setting yourself up for a lot of heartache. Because again, as we know, when you have children, you never can get rid of them. So you're going to have this individual in your life for the rest of your life. And if they're causing you heartache, boy, that's going to be a rough life. So So now we're, we're still looking at God's prescribed way. And like we're getting we're going to get really granular because the Lord is like, I need to show you all. Y'all stepping out of bounds like you're doing you're operating. Not only are we operating outside the will of God when utilizing contraception in marriage, you are taking on the role of God. Let's look at that in scripture. So let's go to Psalm 113 verse nine in the easy to read version. So that is Psalm 113, verse 9, in the easy-to-read version. He gives children to the woman whose home is empty. He makes her a happy mother. Praise the Lord. So what this is talking about is barren women. Barren women. So... Just a note for you uh, Bible scholars. This is actually translated incorrectly in the Amplified Classic. So in the Amplified Classic, it identifies this as spiritual children. Um, But when you actually study out the Hebrew of this word, in the sense of woman and mother in this scripture, it is attached to all the barren women in scripture. Sarah, Leah, Rachel. And so it's talking about wives. It is talking about actual children being God. He gives children to the women whose home is empty. He makes her a happy mother. That's his job. 
That is what the Lord does. That is why when we looked at the earlier scripture, it says that the fruit of a woman's womb is a reward because it comes from God. That ain't our job. Now, we provide the, the tangible pieces needed, sperm, egg, <laughs> which was also designed by God. So, <laughs> But it, that's his job, right? Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 in the New King James Version. So that is Isaiah chapter, 20, uh, chapter 44, verse 24 in the New King James Version. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, and he who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens all alone, who spreads abroad the earth by myself. When utilizing contraception, you are playing a very dangerous game. Because it's as we've seen throughout the history of scripture. When people start to play God, God don't take kindly to that. <laughs> when people start to lift themselves up above God, as we see in Acts with King Herod, Herod struck down because he did not give glory to the Lord. The angels, when they appear to man and they are worshiped as God, they quit to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> You're not about to get me in trouble. The scripture, this scripture is... Isaiah chapter 44, verse 24 in the New King James Version. So we, as human beings, deciding to use contraception in marriage, which is contrary to the design in which God has intended, we are playing God in our own lives. Now let's look at one more. Let's go to Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 in the New King James Version. So that's Psalms 139, 13 through 16 in the New King James Version. <clears throat> For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Talking about the creation process. It belongs into the hand of God. We play no role in that. So that's what we have to understand. And let's look at some examples in scripture. So let's look at Leah. Let's go to Genesis chapter 29. And we're going to look at verses. First, we're going to look at 31 through 35. So Genesis chapter 29, verse 31 through 35. <laughs> and then the King James Version. <laughs> Is it Leah or Leah? Am I pronouncing it? It's Leah. Okay. When the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. Who opened Leah's womb? The Lord. The Lord. God <laughs> Almighty. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> All of them fly. They're the same person. But Rachel was barren. So Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben, for she said, The Lord has surely looked on my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has... <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, giving me this son also, and she called his name Simeon. She received, she conceived again, and bore a son, and said, "Now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons." Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again, and bore a son, and said, "Now I will praise the Lord." Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she stopped bearing. Now let's go to chapter thirty, and we're going to verses seventeen through twenty-one. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. So Leah wanted another child. God listened, and she conceived. Right? We're seeing this process. This ain't got nothing to do 
with the individuals. This is all God. Leah said, God has given me my wages because I've given my maid to my husband. So she called his name, the name of this son that she just conceived, Issachar. Then Leah conceived again and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. An endowment is a heritage. Now my husband will dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dina. It's kind of messed up that she don't get that level of, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. <laughs> All right, now let's look at Rebecca. Let's go to Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. I just imagine, it was six sons, right? Yep. I just imagine Dina, Dina being like, don't mess with me, I got six brothers. <laughs> All of your brothers. <laughs> Who also have sons. Right. <laughs> so, Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. Now, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. So, problem. His wife is barren. Who did Isaac turn to? The Lord. Not IVF, not the doctor, <laughs> not contraception, <laughs> not a shaman. He went to the source of creation. Continue. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. Why? Because as we saw in the earlier scriptures, God is saying, That's my job. When, go ahead. This is about to be off topic with humans, with animals now. I'm just want to make sure it is. You probably won't know. I don't know if you do. Is this wrong for me doing it as well with animals? Because they animals they breed now can't mate properly. So they you're dealing with genetically modified animals. Okay. <laughs> just making sure. Yeah. Just made to get bigger. Yeah, so yeah, that's a whole different process. God's not trying to have godly turkeys. <laughs> yeah, I get it, I get it, I get it. He's not concerned about your turkeys. Yeah. Because even, you know, yeah, sometimes animals naturally that are kept in captivity, that are domesticated, need assistance through breeding. Okay. Yeah. Which... Yeah, no, we're going to get down there. <laughs> oh, all right, so Isaac, 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 Isaac went to God for his wife, and he opened her womb. Let's go to Ruth. In Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. So Ruth chapter 4, verse 13. New King James. New King James, yep, sorry, we're staying in New King James. All this is in New King James. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his, his wife. And when he went into her, when they had sexual intercourse, the Lord gave her conception. And she bore a son. So we thinking it's just about, they take two to tango. No, what God is showing us through scripture, as what Tremiko talked about last week, there is a third member in this marriage, and that is the Lord. When it comes to contraception, there is a third person involved in this process. <laughs> and that is God. When Nefertiri and I finally got into the knowledge and we're like, Lord, we repent and we'll stop being disobedient. It's time for us to have some babies. A doctor tried to tell her she was going to have to have all these surgeries in order for her to be able to conceive. 30 days later, maybe 45, we found out she was pregnant. Because we trusted the Lord. The, this ain't about you. She went to her doctor, just normal, you know, make sure to check, normal process. The doctor took it upon herself to give this report. And we were like, we're not trying to hear that. Because this, this, this is not what we operate in. We're, we operate in faith and trust the Lord. And he said, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And we're, we are raising our hands saying, Lord, we will be obedient to that. There is nothing that is going to stop us from conceiving. And also with God's wife, when she had her first, um, that was a uh, realtor, uh, when she had her first child. Uh, she said, guy's wife. Yeah. yeah it did sound like you said God's wife. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Right. There is a person named mm -hmm. Guy, G-U-Y, um, for the recording. Um, 
But when his wife had her first child, there were complications, and the doctors, again, um, you know, telling you doom and gloom that she wouldn't be able to have any more children. If she did, she would be risking her life and die. And um, I remember she came to me and we were talking about it, and I just encouraged her. The Lord will bless you with as many children as you want to have, as many as he wants you to have, and there's nothing going to be wrong. Don't receive that. We prayed about it. She had four more kids. She got a total of five kids. Nothing wrong with none of them. So it's just like I keep seeing this time and time again, these doctors telling women stuff, and it's just like you are sent straight from Satan. Stop yep. telling this stuff. So we have to know how to be, again, people of faith that trust God because, as Donna said, the two go together. I can't operate in faith if I don't trust God. And I got to trust him to the point that I don't feel like I have to rely on assistance from mankind but that God can do what he's powerful enough to do. I also wanted to add, too, to that, um, just being transparent. I was having a hard time trying to figure out how Scripture says this and how God wants this. And then, yeah, like you said, when we go how man doctors are saying, okay, well, you need to wait, like, 12 months or 18 months to have children. But I'm always, can like, I'm always, like, thinking in the back of my head, like, well, my body belongs to him. He wants me to produce children. So therefore, my body will be healthy and whole to be able to hold the children if he wants me to get pregnant again, just like with Penelope. she I was pregnant at five months after Elias. So it's like, yeah, that was back to back. And a lot of doctors will tell you like, hey, you know, that was back to back. You didn't have time to heal or whatever like that. But I think that's why it's important too to come from the natural to make sure well, after the pregnancy, you take care of your body. So that way, when you get pregnant again, your body is prepared as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, two things. Actually, doctors now, specifically, like, once you get pregnant or you're close to giving a, having the baby, they specifically ask, so what are your birth control plans for the first 6 to 12 months? And They sure do. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, like ma majority of doctors now are literally encouraging for at least a year for women to and men to have birth control, whatever options. They want They want to get you on birth control, like the pill for the woman. Or they, like, you might not want to just use contraceptives or condoms or whatever. You might want to use some other form of, like, medicine to literally, like, prevent birth, I mean, pregnancy from happening because they're worried about the wear and tear on the woman's body or whatever. Um, and then the second thing, too, was, like... <clears throat> It's like a really big assignment of Satan to attack every woman possible with PCOS is like the most common thing right now. You gotta explain which that is means. polycystic ovary syndrome, and it's just when uh, when cysts are on the ovaries and it will prevent and cause delay in ovulation and stuff like that, and so it, it just causes really inconsistent ovulation or no ovulation at all, and you need to ovulate in order to conceive a child, um, and so like. Women, women all the time are every single where you look. I'm um, fighting PCOS. <laughs> I'm doing this. I'm doing like it's like water at this point. To it be is. honest, what you saying? Doctors are doing it. No, or? women. They're, women are getting um, like diagnosed, yeah, diagnosed oh, with PCOS okay. everywhere, and it was even you know like I always do to pray against <clears> it, but. I even almost got that official diagnosis as well. Like, I didn't, to the point, because I didn't want to go to a doctor, but, like, I had my mom, because she's an ultrasound, scan me, and she was just like, you might want to go get checked out because I see a couple, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You might you might have to get help get given birth. You might need help doing this, whatever, or getting pregnant, all, all of that. And I was, no, I didn't mean to say, to say give birth. I'm going to say just pregnancy. But um, she's, like, say, saying I might need medical intervention in order to get pregnant because of what she was seeing, because she sees it all the time. And I was just like, I don't accept that. I but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, yeah, it's like everywhere now. And it's a really big assignment to say, like, that Satan has. And, like, I, it's hard. It's really hard to sometimes combat it just because it's, like, so prevalent. And, like, even Christian people who are like, yeah, the Lord told me I would have children. But I just got a diagnosis with PCOS. And so I'm trying to, like, you know, treat that, whatever. And I'm just like, I really wish more people knew to just trust in the Lord for healing and that he still heals to this day and that you don't need to like take medicine and do all of this other stuff to, in order to get pregnant because like you gotta trust in him yeah I'm, I'm so sorry I'm so sorry I just it was a question that she said I mean something that she said so she said you might need help getting pregnant can you explain that 
Uh, because conceive. of what she, yeah, to conceive, because of what she saw on the scan, she, she was saying like, yeah, I see a little bit of cysts here or whatever she, whatever she saw. Um, I didn't like take it all in because I didn't want to like remember all the stuff, but whatever she saw, she was saying like, because of this thing that I'm seeing in your ovaries and in your uterus, you will need to go get medical intervention in order to conceive because I can see that your uterus and ovaries are not operating correctly. And at that point in time, I was still in my journey of, like, getting for my cycles to be regular. Because they were irregular, but, like, I knew the Lord kept telling me to work on it and pray for it and stuff like that. So, it was getting better, and I shouldn't have got that watch down, but I digress. <laughs> yeah. um, two things, because that's a really good point. I'll, I'll start with that. I'm sorry. You want to speak up? Mm-hmm. Um, the whole PCOS thing, like, right as you said, it's just spreading like wildfire. And there's so many women, like, my PCOS journey, da 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 and all this stuff and a while ago before I was like even married engaged or anything I was having quote unquote like PCOS symptoms am I saying it right Mm -hmm. okay it's a lot of letters I what she never heard of it never heard of it oh good girl good I'm glad because like Rodney just said women are just claiming it like I've even watched a video where there was someone who basically claimed it and was relieved because they were just like I'm so glad I can finally put a name to what's wrong with me and it's just like there was really nothing wrong with you. It's just everybody's body kind of works differently, and there's nothing wrong. But now that you claimed it, it is about to get mm. much wrong. Yep. And so it's just really sad to see. And, you know, I think I mentioned to everybody together one time before during my anatomy scan, they were like, oh, we see X, Y, and Z on your ovaries. I was like, mm, okay, and I move on. Like, and just went after that and prayed. It was like, remove that um, for me, that attack. And Clearly, I got pregnant right away. So whether I was exhibiting like exhibiting symptoms of this or whatever, like the second part of what I was gonna say is for me as a Christian woman, I find comfort in the fact that God is like my whole purpose for you being here in, in this marriage and stuff is to produce godly offspring. Because if that's what the Lord wants, well then it's always gonna be a way made for that to happen. So for me, that's comforting because I don't have to sit here and be like, well, there's any birth complications or. Oh, they said they saw a cyst on my ovary. I'm going to claim that. And, it, you know, like, I'm clearly my body working the way it's supposed to because the Lord got, like, allowed me to get pregnant and have a child. So, for me, it's comforting because I could have sat there and been like, oh, PCOS or whatever the, the females be saying. But, I mean, it just, it makes me happy. Yeah. So. What we are seeing in Scripture, the highest calling for a married man and the highest calling for a married woman is to be a mother. And to be a father. Not once again. This is not single out single women. Y'all just y'all ain't nothing until you get married. No, that's not what I'm saying. For a woman that is married, and for a man that is married, the highest calling that God can put on their life, outside of spiritual offices and things like that, is father and mother, because that is the only process by which godly offspring comes. So if everybody either says like. We all just going to stay single because I don't feel like being married. (laughs) Or we're going to get married and we're not going to have no kids. The Lord is looking around like, okay, so how are we going to be populating this kingdom? Just so I understand, because you keep saying highest calling, so I want to make sure I understand. So for both you and I, just to give an example, the highest calling is mother, father. So would teacher come second to you? It's one of, when I say highest calling, I'm saying one of esteem, a privilege, of an honor. Oh, okay. More so honor, but you still, because I'm like, you still have the role because the Lord called you to be a teacher. So yeah. that is a high calling. You're still held accountable. That's why I wanted to make sure because you were saying highest calling. Yep. So I know. Yep. Okay. Yep. Great question. So one of esteem, honor, and privilege to be a mother and to be a father. And it's, I mean, it's a spit in the face to, to tell the Lord. Nah, I'm opting out of that. All right, let's all right. Let's look at one more example. So let's look at Hannah. Let's go to First Samuel, and we're gonna look at verses one. Sorry, we're gonna look at chapter one, verses nineteen through twenty, and then we're gonna look at chapter two, verse twenty-one. Can you put that all together? Or no.
Well, we're waiting. I'm just so thankful that we um, got a chance to talk no, about this and that Tremiko randomly, I don't even know how she got on the topic when we were talking about conceiving and marriage, but that we came into the knowledge because for a long time, I felt horrible, like horrible, because number one, I was slapping God in the face because I was just like, I don't want no kids. I'm going to wait till I'm 35, 40, like... I was just like, yeah, we not having kids for a while. Like, I was just, like, living our... I was living my best life, and I will say, from a carnal sense in marriage. But I'm just so thankful for this knowledge, even though the Lord was like, ha, I'm going to get y'all back to back. But I understand we were wrong or whatever. So I just wanted to say I'm thankful for this lesson, and I'm thankful that... Trimico was obedient, whether she knew it or not, to just say what the Lord gave her to say, because clearly we all needed to hear it. Yep. Um, so we're going to look at First Samuel, chapter one, verses nineteen through twenty. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it's and for me when we weren't when we my whole mindset, like most people are, and this is this comes back to that trust and faith factor. I want to be able to provide for my children. And I was like, financially, we ain't there yet. So I was like, you know, I'm trying to work. I'm trying to save. I'm doing all, I'm, me, doing all of these things that the Lord has specifically told in Scripture, you don't need to do. And it's like a, for our society, not for God and his kingdom, but for our society, it's like a double-edged sword because childbearing ages are normally your, like, 20s, then you get married in your teens. So when you're younger, all the way up to maybe about like your mid thirties or forties, early like early forties or whatever. But that's typically the time frame that people are like, I just want to live my life. Mm-hmm. So what tends to happen a lot of times, and I'm not talking about for people that are in God, but they shouldn't be doing this either. But let's say just regular people that aren't really even living their life in God. They wait, they live their life, they accomplish everything they want to accomplish. Now they're older and they're like, let's have children. And they can't conceive or it's really hard for them to conceive. So now they got to go to all these doctors and get all this, you know, mm-hmm. in, what is it, in vitro fertilization mm-hmm. type stuff like that. But had you done it when you were in your like childbearing ages and stuff like that, you wouldn't have had that. So it's like you complicate things. And then even too with people that get on birth control, it does stuff to their body. And then by the time they're ready to have kids, they can't because of all the complications of the birth control um, telling their body not to produce. So it's like we make these decisions without God and then later want to play God and be like, okay, now I'm ready to do X, Y, Z. And it's just like, uh, sorry for you, no. So... You know, those are consequences. Whenever we're making decisions outside of including God, it has significant ramifications, and we have to come to the realization of that. All right. So, First Samuel chapter one, verses nineteen through twenty, and then we're going to jump down to two, chapter two, verse twenty-one. Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, and returned and came to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife. And the Lord remembered her. So pausing here, Hannah was barren and could not conceive. She went to the temple. She was praying. The prophet, which I believe was Eli, yeah. was like, thought she was drunk and stammering. And was like, what's going on? Because this is not appropriate behavior in the temple of the Lord. She corrected him. And then he said, oh, cool, got it. Go home and it'll be unto you. She went home. This is the thing. Trust in faith. The prophet told her. You got what you want. It will be unto you. What you desire, the Lord is going to give to you. She had to trust that. Mm -hmm. She had to put faith to that trust. Because to get pregnant, outside of the one example of Mary, you got to have sex. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So had she just went home and been like, "Ah, I guess we'll see, (laughs) she would not have gotten what the Lord had told her. She had to go home and have sex. So she went home and had sex with her husband And the Lord remembered her. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked for him from the Lord. She knew exactly 
She ain't named him after his daddy. <laughs> the Lord gave me this baby. <laughs> we were just the vessels. The tools that had to be used. The contraception came from God. Now let's go to chapter 2, verse 21. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. The Lord visited Hannah. Like we, we, like seriously, when I was studying this, and there's other examples, but this lesson when it goes into the website, you can look it up. The Lord is clearly showing that I am intricately involved in this process. It said the Lord visited Hannah, moved on her by his power, and she had five more children. All right. So, as I said before, contraceptives are about exhibiting autonomy over our bodies and dictating our will as a married couple. To fully understand the mind of God on contraceptives, we have to explore this, right? We got to understand what does the Lord view when it comes to human beings' autonomy? Because everybody talks about you have the will of God and then you have free will. But what we're going to look at is when you want to live in right standing with God, your will is his will. If you want to be autonomous and have free will, you will do so and not be in the stand, right standing with God. All right? So... Let's begin with answering the initial question, because everybody says, it. you know, it's my body, it's my choice. Ah, well, let's see what God got to say about it. Do our bodies really belong to us? Wait, did you see the Chris Rock special? <laughs> no, I only saw like clips. Which one? Oh, he it, it's said. new. It just came out on Netflix. I have to check it out. Okay, because he said, I saw everything about the real about, I don't want to give it yeah. away, but it's. Wait, what did you say, Tremika? So, Chris Rock has a new special on Netflix. And the only reason why I mention it is because that came up. My body, my choice. I mean, I won't be giving a whole aesthetic away because he says a lot. But it's interesting because he says in there, I agree with you. It's your body, it's your choice. Then he says, you should be able to kill babies. And then the whole audience got quiet because it's like, that's what you're doing. I'm not about to play games up here. So he never really gives it away for real, for real, which way he stands. But the way he did it throughout his whole jo joke is you're killing babies. So, and then it's just like, it makes you now, it puts a mirror in front of your face and make you look at yourself. Basically is what he did. And I love the way, it was a number of things he did in there. I kind of like the way he did it. When you watch it, you got to, you got to get past the 25 minute mark because I cut it off and then I went back to it. But it gets better the more it goes because in the beginning, I'm like, you are not funny. However, uh, however, that, I thought that was very interesting the way he took that approach because a lot of people keep trying to say my body, my choice, but ignoring the fact that you're literally killing. You're trying to say it's my choice to kill if I want to, but nobody wants to acknowledge that's exactly what you're saying when you say my body, my choice. And I just like the way he just put that mirror in front of everybody's face and said, this is what it is. You, I'm going to make you look at this. Yeah. So, yeah, I heard people say it wasn't funny. <laughs> yeah. You got to get past a certain mark and then yeah. it starts to pick up. All right. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to look at verse 15 and then jump to 19 and 20 in the New King James Version. So that is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. And then we're going to jump to 19 through 20 in the New King James Version. I'm just going to give it a second so people can see the scripture yeah. writing down. <laughs> Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. So... Paul is saying that your bodies ain't just your bodies. They are part of the body of Christ. Will you use the body of Christ to be joined with a harlot? This is talking about fornication. All right, now let's go to verse uh, 19 and 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own 
for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So this first concept of it's my body, my choice. God is saying, no, I pay for that. <laughs> that that's mine. Your body belongs to me. And we're talking to born again Christians. Because that is who is a member of the body of Christ. Born of water and of spirit. Our bodies belong to God. Let's go to Psalm 100 verse 3. So Psalm 100 verse 3 in the New King James Version. 100 and verse 3. Mm-hmm. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us. And not we ourselves. We are his people in the sheep of his pasture. Ownership. All right? Let's look at one more. Let's go to Romans chapter 14, verse 8. And we're staying in the New King James Version. It says Romans chapter 14, verse 8 in the New King James Version. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We belong to him. So it is not our body, our choice when it comes to contraception. It is not about our bodily autonomy from God. We don't even own our own bodies. (laughs) They don't belong to us, right? So now let's move to the second question. Do we have the autonomy to make decisions independent of God and be considered righteous in his eyes. Because that's what you have a lot of Christians doing. I'm like, that don't even go together. It don't. It don't. Yeah. Do we, as Christians, as disciples, have the autonomy, meaning the independence, to make decisions independent of God and... Be considered righteous in his eyes, meaning with right standing. Because you got a lot of Christians now thinking they can have both. (laughs) They can have it their way. No, (laughs) you can't. You cannot make decisions independent of God and be in right standing. They do not go together. Like I said earlier, as a Christian, your will is God's will. Not my will, but thine will be done. I'm sacrificing me to glorify him in my life. You can't be independent of God and then be like, Lord, consider me righteous. What? (laughs) That's like trying to say as a kid, you grown, but your mama and your daddy pay all your bills, put money in your pocket, put the clothes on your back, and put the food in your belly. You're not grown. You're not grown. (laughs) You are a child. 35, but a child. <laughs> okay. So, this is broken down and revealed in two parts in Scripture. So, the answer is no. You cannot be independent of God and be considered righteous. And we see that revealed in two parts. One, to love the Lord is to obey his commandments. So, if I say I love God, it is not my will but thine will be done. Whatever you says, whatever you say goes. So that that right there, I am not independent. If I am saying, Lord, I love you, the only way the Lord feels love from us to him is through obedience. That is the only way. There was no other way. It is not talking about feelings. It is not talking about gifts. It is not talking about offering. None of that shows God that we love him. The only thing that scripture reveals is obedience is God's love language. That is it. So let's go to 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 2 and 3 in the New King James Version. So that's 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 and 3 in the New King James Version. By this we know that we love the children of God, When we love God and keep his commandments, for this is the love of God, 
that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Let's look at another one. So let's go to, we're going to stay in 1 John. Let's go to chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 6 and then jump to verse 24 in the New King James Version. So that is 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Then we're going to jump to 24 in the New King James Version. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Well, Lord, what does it mean to abide in you? Let's go to verse 24. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. The Holy Spirit tells us that we abide in God because the Holy Spirit convicts us. We are not operating in obedience and it rewards us and applauds us. And we have peace and we have joy and we have all of these other benefits that come through obedience. So when a person you can tell any person, if they're trying to figure out, do they have the spirit of the Lord and are they are abiding him? It's a simple question. Do you obey his commandments? If the answer is no, you don't abide in him. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is your witness to that statement. All right, let's look at another one. <laughs> okay. Let's, we're going to stay in 1 John, and <laughs> let's go to chapter 2, and we'll look at verses 4 through 6 in the English Standard Version. John really was the one in this obedience. Y'all going to learn this. <laughs> so verse John, chapter 2, verses 4 through 6 in the English Standard Version. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, he being God, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, him being God, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. As Christ, God the Father manifested in the flesh. All right. As Chimiko takes her notes. So, part one, we said, to be, can you make decisions? Independent of God and be considered righteous. No. And scripture reveals it in two ways. The first one we just looked at. To love the Lord is to obey his commandments. If I am walking in obedience of God, I am not independent of him. Now let's look at part two that is revealed in scripture. We are commanded that everything we are, have, and do is to be guided by and through God. We are not independent of him. So first of part two. We must love God with all our being. <clears throat> Let's go to Acts chapter 17, verse 28 in the New King James Version. So that is Acts chapter 17, verse 28 in the New King James Version. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So in God, we live, move, and have our being. How am I independent of him? When everything that I am is in God. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 in the New King James Version. We're still looking at we must love God with all our being. Everything that is within us. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. There is nothing in us that should be left over <laughs> when it comes to loving God. And how do we love God? Keeping his commandments. Keeping his commandments. Don't that make so much more sense now when you look at this? Because with my heart, soul, and strength, I got to resist the devil. I have to align my will. I have to renew my mind. I have to make sure that I'm not falling into temptation. Because it takes all of that and more. Which is why we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes all of that and more to be obedient. That is why we You must love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. All right. Second thing. In part two, he guides our understanding and decision making. Let's go to Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six in the New King James Version. So that's Proverbs chapter three, verses five through six. Yeah, five through six. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So, the commandment here is to lean not into, on our, to lean not to our own understanding, to acknowledge him in all our ways. How am I making decisions independent of God? When the commandment is not to do that. <laughs> Let's go to Proverbs chapter twenty-eight, verse twenty-six, in the ESV. So that's Proverbs chapter twenty-eight, verse twenty-six. In the English Standard Version. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. (laughs) But he who walks in wisdom, skillful application of the word of God, will be delivered. So, we are commanded. Everything we are, have and do is in God. We must love God with all our being. He guides our understanding and decision making. And then what we're about to look at now, everything we do is done for his glory. So let's go to Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 17 and verse 23 in the English Standard Version. So that is Colossians chapter 3 and what? We're not going to look it through yet. Verse 17 and then we're going to jump to verse 23 in the English Standard Version. All right, so we're starting at verse 17, and then we're going to jump to verse 23. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's go to verse 23. Can we define this? And the only reason why I say this is because a lot of people will do things and slap Jesus' name on it instead of did it in Jesus' name. So what does that really mean? So everything that we are, so when you give your word, that's what in word means. So when you give your word, you say you're going to do something or you're you're speaking or whatever. And indeed, in action, it should be guided by God in alignment with God and given by God. So you can't just say you can't decide, Okay, we're going to do this thing over here. And Jesus said to do it. No. Did the Lord tell you to do that? Because that's what that's what that's about. Is when I'm moving and speaking in God, everything is going to give him glory because it's going to manifest. God doesn't get glory from our failures as humans. Right? Because what it looks like, because you didn't slap God's name on it, well, your Lord ain't all that powerful. Because <laughs> you said he told you to do this and it ain't working out. And the Lord up there now, like, now you got me out here looking foolish. Because you wanted to do something I didn't tell you to do. <laughs> that makes me think about this season of, um, what's that called? Married at First Sight, that I was watching. Uh, Awful. And this, this one couple had the nerve to be a Christian couple. I know y'all can't see my hands, but it was, they were the messiest couple on that show, and they kept slapping God name on everything, and I was like, you're making our people, which is not you, look yeah. bad, yeah. Mm-hmm. but y'all claiming to be us. Like, it's, it was so awful. I'm like, oh, I wish people would stop with the God said, God told me to narrative. You don't even know him. Awesome. Like, yeah. And then also what I'll add, thank you, Holy Spirit, what I'll add is in your routine actions, you represent God. 
So when I go to work, I work to the fullest because I'm representing God. When I volunteer, I'm not lazing in my volunteering because I represent God. So that's also part of it. Not I'm slapping Jesus' name on this job. Yeah. No, I'm going to make sure that no one has an ill word to speak of me because I'm representing my father. Yeah. I don't know if this is a good example or not, but um, where I work, um, my manager knows that I'm very moral and very ethical. And so um, when it comes to a certain process of doing stuff, she told everybody else on the team to do it one way, which is they have to lie to get it accomplished. But with me, she told me to do it the correct way because she know I ain't about to do something that's immoral or unethical. So I was having a conversation with the person I'm partnered with, and she was just really expressing how uncomfortable she is with it because she has to lie. She's like, I don't want to lie. So, again, not – and here's the thing. I'm realizing more and more, because the more you live, you realize, like, I don't have to preach Jesus. I just do what Jesus would say or speak like a normal Christian would speak. So I told her in this conversation, I said, don't let anyone tell you to do something wrong and, and you feel like you have to do it. I said, if, I said, and I flat out told that person, I said, this person knows I'm very moral and ethical and I'm not doing that. And that's why this person didn't come to me and tell me to do it the wrong way. So I said, I encourage you whenever someone tells you to do something that's immoral or unethical to say no and do it the right way. And then like she thought about it and she was like, thank you. Because that's what someone needs for you to be that light and show them. But then another thing was that I thought about, because I just... I am in the age of, I'm not hiding who I am anymore. Yeah. Being black, being Christian, whatever. And so something had happened on the job. Oh, my internet went down and it kept acting up on Friday morning and it was snowing. I couldn't even go into the office. So um, I prayed and rebuked Satan and then it just started working. And so the same person, she was like, oh, I see you work. I see you're up because we're on teams. And I said, and flat out, didn't even think twice about it. I said, I rebuked Satan, and it started working again. And she was like, oh. She was like, well, my daughter keep missing her bus. I may need you to rebuke Satan because Satan is a... And she's not even spiritual. Like, she doesn't believe in God. But now because I say spiritual things, like, as far as my Christian relationship with God, I'm starting to hear her pick up and say similar things. So, and what God is showing me, if you just be who you are and stop trying to hide who you are... Yeah. It actually casts a light on people who even say they don't believe in me or whatever like that to start seeing things from a different perspective without them trying to see it from a different perspective. So, I don't know, that was just interesting. I just thought about that and that whole we live, we move, and have our being in him, whatever we do in the name, we it has to be right, number yep. one. But then number two, we got to stop hiding who we are because I feel like we do that a lot in society. Yeah, all right, so let's, in, let's go to verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. So when we out here operating, it, once again, it's I'm a reflection of my father. I'm not doing this to please man. I'm doing this to please God. Right. So we cannot have autonomy in our decision making and be independent of God and then call ourselves righteous. Because exactly. what we have just seen through scripture, that that is contradictory. They are on opposite sides. You either want to be independent of God or you want to be righteous. You can't have both. All right. So the question that we're going to answer, right, which I already told you to answer to it, but we're going to walk through scripture. Does it really matter? Because that's what people will say, right? Like, that's just your opinion. Or, you know, that's that's the decision you make for your family, mm -hmm. Right. I hate when you would say something. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we both looking at the same scripture. You came, you walked away with you making that decision for your family. Okay. All right. <laughs> it is abundantly clear that God's intention, design, and purpose for marriage is godly offspring. It is also clear that contraception is in direct opposition to that intention, design, and purpose. However, right, the question then becomes, is it a sin if I do it? And will it send me to hell? No. Can you just repeat everything? Yep. It is abundantly clear that God's intention, design, and purpose for marriage is godly offspring. It is also clear that contraception is in direct opposition 
to that, to God's intention, design, and purpose for marriage. However, everyone has the same question. Is it a sin if I use contraception, and will it send me to hell? Answer on both fronts is yes. It is a sin, and yes, it will send you to hell. And I'm going to walk you through scripture to show that. So, let's go to Genesis chapter 38, verses 6 through 10 in the New Living Translation. Genesis 38. Verses 6 through 10 in the New Living Translation. Wait, what is it? NLT. It might be New Life. I'm, I was, oh, I was right. Okay. Yeah, NLT. So, Genesis 38, verses 6 through 10 in the New Living Translation. In the course of time, Judah arranged for his firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. But Ur was wicked, was a wicked man in the Lord's sight. So the Lord took his life. Then Judah said to Ur's brother, Onan, go and marry Tamar. As our law requires of the brother of a man who has died, you must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, who is now his wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. Bringing it to our terminology, he pulled out. But the Lord considered it evil. For Onan to deny a child to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life too. All right. Well. (laughs) So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to break it down so everybody knows what we're talking about here. So in this passage, we see the practice of the Leverite marriage. Mm -hmm. The brother of a deceased man being obliged to marry his brother's widow. So that he could produce an heir for his brother. The reason for this was tribal inheritance. Because if he died before having a son, that is who inherited a son, his brother would marry the widow. This isn't a sexual act. This is a marriage. That first child, that first son would take the name of his dead father. Then every child born after that would be the brother's children. Let's look at that in scripture. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 25, and we're going to read verses 5 through 10 in the New King James Version. So this is Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 through 10 in the New King James Version. I'm still stuck on the brother being wicked, and so he got his life taken. What was he doing? It don't ever say. It don't ever say. Dang. It just says he was wicked. Um, okay. If brothers dwell together, And one of them dies and has no son. The widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband brother, my husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elders of his city shall call him and speak to him and tell him this is our law. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face, and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who had his sandal removed. And just so you understand the cultural context, to be barefoot is to be shamed. It means you ain't got nothing. So when people would be like, all I got is the clothes on my back, you ain't even got that. <laughs> right? So the process, Jack and John are brothers. Jack is married to Sarah. Jack dies without producing an heir. 
John then marries Sarah. John and Sarah. It's John's not married. John is unmarried. Yeah, thank you for adding. John is unmarried. That's why it says they dwell oh, oh, together. Wait. No, John is unmarried. Okay. He's un well, in today's time, he would be unmarried. Yeah. Back then, okay. contextually, he might already have a wife or two. Um, John then marries Sarah. John and Sarah have Alex. Alex takes on the name of Jack's surname, his family name. That is Jack's heir. Then John and Sarah go on and have a bunch of kids, and all them kids belong to John. But that firstborn son belongs to Jack. That is the process. And now, as we see, pay attention to what we just read in Deuteronomy 25. The intention is marriage, right, to produce children. We see this. That is why they got to get married. This ain't no just sexual act. Number two, he could refuse. He would be shamed, but he could refuse. That is very important. Now let's go back to, dinner, uh, to Genesis 38. Verses, um, we're going to look at verses 9 through 10. What version? Um, go back to uh, NLT. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. But he still married her. Y'all see the difference, right? He still married her. So whenever he had sex with his brother's wife, he pulled out. He spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child who belonged to his brother. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life. The action that he was doing, preventing pregnancy, God, because the only way his brother could get an heir was through sexual intercourse and, contracept and conceiving. And he was denying that, and God called him evil and killed him. So we're back in Genesis chapter 38, and we're just looking at 9 through 10 in the NLT. So is everybody on that same page? So we can all move in one accord. The action of Question. him. Oh, go ahead, babe. Yeah, so I know if, when I'm explaining this to somebody. So somebody who is um, the couple that is married, they are um, getting in the way of conceiving and they come into the knowledge, and they weren't killed, that would be uh, mercy. Correct. Right? God showed them mercy through the simple nature, natures. Correct, because they are, they are ignorant. They do not know. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I, under, I was getting the right definition right. Okay. And, so is it always a sin to pull out during intercourse? This is what I will say. It is a sin to prevent pregnancy. So if you are pulling out in sexual intercourse with your wife to prevent pregnancy, you are sinning. Well, why would you be pregnant? I would, That's, I would, like, when people try to get into this always, I'm saying what Scripture said. Yeah. Like, I'm not, like, I'm God, saying what Scripture God. says. When, if you are pulling out to prevent pregnancy, you are sinning. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, that's up. So it's a heart posture. Like, I'm not about to get in. Well, if you do it on Tuesday, but not on Thursday, maybe, no. <laughs> if your heart is, I want to have no kids, so I'm pulling out, you are sinning. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So why is it evil? Evil is anything that is contrary to the word of God. We've already built that foundation. The purpose of marriage is for godly offspring to prevent that God shows in Genesis chapter 38 that is evil because it is contrary to my word. Let's go to uh, 3rd John. 3rd John? 3rd John? Third, third. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Verse 1 and 11. It just don't sound right. It don't flow. <laughs> okay. Verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 11. The third book of John. That sounds better. <laughs> English Standard Version. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil 
has not seen God. All right, let's look at one more. Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 15. In the Living Bible, TLB. Oh, so I did have it here. Oh, thank you. I didn't know. Could we have looked at it earlier? Okay, okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then he said to them, you wear a noble, pious expression in public, but God knows your evil hearts. Your pretense brings you honor from the people, but it is an abomination in the sight of God. Evil is contrary to the word of God. So what Onan was doing, intentionally pulling out to prevent pregnancy, the Lord said, that is evil, and I'm going to take your life. <laughs> Judgment for his sin. And this is how we know a sin was committed. Because when we looked at Deuteronomy in 25, there was a process. He could have said no and just lived with his shame, but he was wicked. He wanted the benefits without the responsibility. And when you are operating in contraception, in a married, as a married couple, that's what you were doing. I want all the benefits, but not the responsibility. And I am not operating in the intent, design, and purpose that God has established for marriage. Um, so, I wanted to wrap this today. And we only got four minutes left. So I'm going to, everything is in here. There's a ton of scriptures. But what we're going to, uh, Because it's only two slides. Oh, but how many scriptures? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> just finish it next week. All right. So we're going to look at. Don't rush it. Yeah, I will finish next week in the beginning of class and then, because it's not going to take the whole class. At least I don't think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we yeah. always say that. So <laughs> we will finish this in class because I have a bunch of other scriptures I'm going to walk you through to show that hell is the consequence of an evil lifestyle. Yeah, you can't just rush yeah. that. Yeah. So I want to show you that through scripture. That's the one. <laughs> you got real weak. Yeah. So we're going to look at that next week. And we're going to look at other examples that God calls sin when you misuse something he's designed for a specific purpose. You definitely yeah. need to take your time. Yeah. Like, so we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to wrap up next week. I'm trying to figure out how you was going to get through that in three minutes. I wasn't. I wasn't. That's what I'm saying. Uh, he fooled with himself. All right. So, with the last three minutes, because we just we did just go through a very jam packed scripture. Yes. Any questions, comments? Because I, I'm yes. telling you, I was. I mean, I knew this exist. Like I knew this passage of scripture, but like I ain't never spent no time studying. <laughs> so like, I do have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. I think I'm late. I don't know. My feedback is coming late. So sorry if it's like I'm interrupting. I'm not trying to. It's just late. But anyways, um, just trying to make sure when explaining this to people, because ever since we had this conversation, what was it? Since last week you started this? Yeah. It seems as though like pe more people want to ask, so when is the next child? When is the next child? Or are y'all preventing since you had, you know, the next child so quick? A last child so quick like in just the simplest form not long-winded how would you explain it to somebody you're witnessing to when god wants us to have another child we'll have another child yeah. just that's it that's yeah. it and then if they ask for additional information about like well what about contraceptions and stuff like that, then you could go in further detail but i would just say in answering the question in both witnessing and just casual conversation when the Lord wants us to have another child, we're going to have another child. Okay, because that's my response. I just didn't know if, you know, because I used it yesterday when somebody, this person asked me. But I was just like, is that enough? So that's why I wanted to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Cause is it, especially in casual conversation. I don't know you. Like, <laughs> I'm not about to go walk you through this. Like, if you just oh, ask. Well, in, this yeah. case, in this case, we did. But I'm just saying, yeah, I get what you're saying for witnessing purposes. I will say it actually, like, answering the question like that. At, in my experience anyway has cut the conversation short really fast because it's like you can't you can't say nothing after that because like yeah. people used to always ask every single time we had a family event whatever oh when you and Andrew thinking about having kids whenever the Lord gave us one so 
They start asking that for after we get right to this one. Whenever the Lord had given us another one, like, and then that's just it, because it's like usually if you're like, oh, well, we want to, you know, have one or two, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, start asking more detailed questions. But once I give you the answer of what the Lord wants us to, you ain't got nothing to say, because it's not up to me no more. So yeah. it cut the conversation pretty quick. Yeah, and now the build off that is if they do start, are you, you're putting into the position of actually having to educate, right, mm-hmm. about the Lord's position on contraception, then you're going to have to have a more nuanced conversation in the sense that it ain't no simple one-liner that I'm about to give you that sums up everything that we just went through. Yeah. And everybody laughed at us when we said we Got it. You're right. Shame. You're absolutely right. Because when people... I went, can't hear anything she said. Oh, I said, and everybody laughed at us when we said we wanted six kids. <laughs> Trey, Trey has you absolutely he right. It is. It is the what Lord wants six Harrises. <laughs> That's Harris what's gonna happen. <laughs> and I'll just say to leave it with this, you know, since for the recording too, because we are in this knowledge, we have an obligation to teach this to other people whom want to who want to know. Make sure we're doing our part as we're having these babies that the Lord wants us to have making sure we're taking care of our bodies. I just want to make sure I say that because there is a healing process that takes place afterwards during postpartum. And it is crucial just in case you do get pregnant again. Like, yeah, we're renting these bodies for now, but we do have an obligation to take care of them so that we can have a healthy child the next go round and produce healthy babies. So I wanted to make sure I say that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I was just going to just like comment. There's something about just the scripture that we went over, the bulk of scripture we just went over with, how he was like the semen going to ground to prevent pregnancy. It's just like, I just love that it's just in the Bible because even if people are like, okay, well, I don't use contraception, but I, you know, pull out, whatever. It's like, well, you are still trying to prevent pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Your woman might not be on birth control. You might not be using a condom, but, like, you're still preventing pregnancy. And it's just, it, yeah, and it's like a clear example in the Bible. And I'm just like, hmm, people have no excuse. <laughs> and it's just it's so clear. Like I said, I was anticipating this being a 10-minute parking lot answer. And the Lord was like, no, no, no. I got a lot to say about this topic. <laughs> so we go have this conversation. So many people prevent pregnancy. Uh, yeah, I'm like, I even, me and Nefertiti are dealing with those types of conversations now with people in their mind who love us and think they are well intentioned. And it's like, no, we're not about to operate in disobedience. Yeah. And um, last thing I mentioned, uh, it's this is uh, somebody I know, and she now has had her like fourth kid, and she kept getting like pregnant from like, Three month, three to five months postpartum, she had four kids back to back. Um, and with her third child, she tried to go on birth control. And for her, the Lord immediately was like, that's a no. She did go on it, but like he immediately told her like after a while, when she, I guess when she finally listened, was like, this is a no. And then it showed in her body too. Like the doctor told her she was having a miscarriage and the Lord told her specifically, you gonna pray against that. Your baby is perfectly fine. And she, I think she said that that was one of her smoothest pregnancies that she had because she just kept on praying and like you know she, eventually she went back into the doctor and they was like, oh, this baby is kicking, healthy, heartbeat, great, whatever. And she's just like now she's a super advocate of like do not go on birth control. I don't know if her standpoint is correct in terms of like just don't go on it because you know the Lord needs you, but she's just like it messed up my body and she wasn't supposed to do it in the first place. So. And it's this is. I'm going to just be honest. Like, this type of revelation, you it takes takes time in building that relationship with the Lord to be like, go here, go there. This is what I said about it. This is how this lines up. Because this is literally building precept upon precept. Like, this is not going to, it says here, don't do it. Don't do it. Right? <laughs> no. We got to build you up and walk you through. Because also the Lord knows our hearts. We not going to take the just don't do it. Show me in scripture. How does he explain this? What is God's mind on this thing? And this is not taught. This is not taught. 
Um, Elijah said, be fruitful and multiply is legit. We used to see families having six to eight babies. Now, we, now we're now we seeing one or none. Interesting conversation. Absolutely. Like, the U.S. right now is borderline on, an, on a reverse birth rate, yeah. which meaning, like, there are more people dying than being born. And when you go back to when you said train up a child in the way that it should go, it's also not being taught to us as kids maturating into adulthood that we are to seek the Lord and the things that he wants for us. It's go pursue your dreams, yep. create goals, and go after those goals. Make your uh, what, vision board. Yep. And all Everything on your vision board is nothing that the Lord told you. So it's hard to transition into okay, Lord, what do you want from me and let me do that versus if I was raised to believe this, it would be an easy thing of you not fighting him on what you want to see in your life happen. But we tend to do that because that's not the mindset we were raised with. So we're constantly finding ourselves kicking against God in our life choices and situations and realizing we got to reel it back in. So we need to, you know, if we were taught that earlier, this wouldn't be such a struggle. I have a comment before we go. go. But um, I am very happy that we can teach our kids this from a really early, early point because, like you said, it is a narrative of, like, like Elijah said, one child or none. Um, I don't know if y'all have ever read the book. And it's actually a really old book, but, like, them old books was predicting the future. Brave New World is basically, like, the whole world is, like, contraceptives and stuff like that. And, like, it's, like, wrong to get pregnant and produce a child. It's actually a really interesting book. I read it in an AP class. Wait, is it wrong to get pregnant and produce yeah, like, it's a Yeah. It's a fictional book. Yeah, oh. so it's a... You can, like, look up the premise okay, of gotcha. it, but it's, like, a That's new... It's, like, a in-the-future setting where there's all these different classes of people and contraceptives is, like, a must. Like, it's, okay. like, a thing. And it's just, like, there's no babies being produced and stuff like that. The way people are produced is, like... kind of. It kind of makes me think about IVF, like... Everything is artificial, and it's just like, wow, like, even a hundred years ago, however long that was, like, that stuff was being predicted, but, you know, I'm glad that we can teach our kids, like, hey, the point of marriage is to produce godly offspring, so if you're not ready to have no child, don't get married yet, and I'm, I'm so comfortable with telling my child that, and if he don't get married till he's 35, because that's when he's ready, I am so thankful that at least I, you know, yeah. in, ingrained that in him, because nobody, nobody taught me that, so... Yeah. Elijah. Um, so Eli says, can we talk about adoption? Can families adopt? Can singles adopt children even if they're not married? So to your first part, yes, uh, adoption is cool. Like scripture talks about that we need to be taking care of the orphans. One, one method of taking care of an orphan is bringing them into your home. Of course, there are other ways. That's not the only way. We talked about this last week a little bit when it's talking about singles adopting children. It becomes, the question becomes, why would you want to raise up a child outside of the design of the Lord? Because as we saw in Malachi, he joined man and woman and made them one to produce God, the offspring. So the design for children has been to be in a two-parent household. So as a single person, the question becomes, like, why are you doing that? And then, Adriana, go ahead. Okay, Bye. hello, everyone. Hello. Um, this might be a little bit off topic, but kind of related to the topic. So I was trying to figure out how to make sure I word this. But I, just to tell you a little scenario, I was in the car, and usually I don't turn on the radio, but my phone and everything has been acting up lately. So I had the radio on and it was a song that came on that um, I used to listen to when I was a kid. I haven't heard it in years. And I'm like, hey, what's up? you know how you start, you hear your beat and you start moving and stuff. And before I knew it, I was saying the words and I heard what I said. And I was like, wait a minute, that's not of God. You know, like I shouldn't be listening to this song. And it just kind of, God just kind of showed me how us as children, like the things that are poured into us so early on that is not of God, like the things that set in front of us. So it's like our mindsets as young children 
growing up to young teenagers, young adults, and what have you, is so focused on what the world has placed in front of us instead of God's word. And it's truly contradictory to what we're, how we're really supposed to be living our lives. And it's like, wow, why didn't somebody grab me or tap me on the shoulder to say, hey, you know, and it also showed me how as young kids, our mindsets, like what we're saying, we don't even really understand the words that we're really saying. It's like the first thing that came to me was like, whoa, death and life and the power of the tongue. What are you speaking into your life? I had to rebuke everything and turn off the radio and everything. But it just showed me that, if we're not brought up, like, I, I love um, the married couples and how they're instilling this so early on in their children's life because God's word is the governance of our life. And if the wrong things are being placed in front of us and in our ears and our eye gates, we don't know any better. It's like, and we don't even really understand it as a, as a child's mindset. We think it's one thing, you know, that's like... A song came on, Juicy Fruit. I thought it was the Juicy Fruit gum that they was talking about. I honestly just realized that they was talking about something totally different, right. you know, because I haven't heard the song in so long. But I, when, as a kid, in my mindset as a kid, I thought it was the gum. You know, they talking about something totally different. That gum, y'all. And <laughs> it's like the things that you spoke into your life, though, because of the words that are speaking out of your mouth, you don't even understand it. So it's like so important to understand and how it kind of relates because you guys are talking about Mary, how so many single people get out there and get into things that they're not supposed to, because it's kind of been poured into their life in a subconscious mindset all their life pretty much, you know? And it's, so I'm just grateful for you all and what you guys teach and what you guys stand for so that we can go out and really teach and help other people in our own lives and our children as well do better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Eli says, I yeah, know. I'm happily talking about this. This was a good conversation. Yeah. No, it's it is definitely good information to help as God's intention is for us to make decisions in him. Because to what Leah said, and I can say the same thing for our children, being able to teach them growing up, now they'll understand that marriage ain't just about you love that person and you want to spend the, the rest of your life with them. They God has expectations on that union. Are you ready for those expectations? Because I want to reiterate for this recording to what we talked about last week, that marriage is a choice that you make. You decide if I want to be married. It is not a requirement that every single individual be married. You need to be making that decision with all the ready available information that you can. Um, because I feel like a lot of people who got married wouldn't have. Yeah. If they understood God's expectations of the married couple. Yeah. And then to Yeah, okay. definitely does? would have probably waited on that had I known before in the sense of like it being in right standing with the Lord is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Donovan, when does God call people to singleness? Is that a choice? Or does God actually say, you know, I want you to be single for the rest of your life? How does that work if marriage is a choice? So it's twofold. So a person can decide to be single. And then Paul speaks of individuals who are called to a gift of singleness. Um, because he himself is basically saying that. I don't know if it's a call, a gift is. A gift, yeah, thank you, thank you. A, a gift of singleness to be able to abstain. Because that's really what it's, what it's about is to be able to abstain for the entirety of your life. That is a gift. Um, and, of course, he gives people that gift because some folks got, he needs some people operating in the kingdom 24-7. Paul was one of them. Because what Paul, he was putting his life at risk. He was traveling all the time. I ain't got time for no wife and kids. Because I would be, by trying to maintain this lifestyle and be married with children, I would be in sin. Because the Lord says in Scripture, through Paul's teaching, that when you get married, you have to focus on the things of the world and how you please your spouse. So it is a gifting of singleness that is given to individuals. And then you have some people who are decided, I'm not ready to get married yet. Not that I'm never going to get married. I'm just not ready to make that decision today. Does that make sense? Yes. I have, a, um, I have another question. Is outside of like the marriage thing. If 
we have, you know how like the other week we were talking about laziness and men being hard workers to provide for themselves and their families. Well, as a single person, if we're working too much or we're working jobs or we're doing things and it's taking attention away from God, can we let it go? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and again, realize there's going to be adjustments made. You yeah. cannot live beyond your paycheck. So we want both, right? Yeah. We want to be able to have all the luxuries we want in life, but then we also want to, you know what I'm saying? Serve God 100%. So it's, it come, life comes with sacrifice is what I'm trying to say. And this society does not realize that because at one hand, you just we say yes to you, and then you're going out trying to get all the Netflix accounts and this special <laughs> here and this, this and that, and you can't afford it. Okay, yeah, well, then that means if you're working one job and you can't work two because it's taking you away from God, you're going to have to sacrifice some of the luxuries that you desire in life. So I want to make that really clear because anytime this discussion comes up for whatever reason, the Lord always puts that in my head, there is a sacrifice attached to it. Yep. So don't think that God's going to just rain money out the sky so that you can enjoy every luxury you want at the same time. That is not reality, people. Yep. And sometimes that sacrifice... So what was the question? I just want to make sure I understood the question because it was I couldn't hear it all. So the question was if it was taken away from his time with God, then could he quit the job? Like if, it's, if you have two, three jobs and that's and side taking hustle, you, yeah, and... it's taking you away from being able to spend the time. I'm not saying work. quit my main job, not the one that paid the bills. Right. No, 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 <laughs> that no, 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 no. would be, that yeah. would be stupid. Yeah. You're prioritizing but people your time. out here doing that though. So that's why I wanted to make it clear because people out here just don't want to work and they that's got business. foolish. Yeah. So that's straight foolishness. Yeah. But Eli wasn't saying like people who don't want to work, but I'll even add in some people who have extremely competitive long hour jobs. If their relationship with the Lord is suffering, that's a conversation that they need to have with the Lord. You're right. Like if they if they are CEO of Fortune 500 and they traveling every single week and they work 16 hour days, and they're single and the Lord is like, I ain't heard from you in three weeks. <laughs> you you haven't studied in a month. You haven't fasted in a half a year. Some adjustments got to be made because the the Lord is still saying you still got to give me mine. And I think to what Chamigo said, a lot of people don't wrap their mind around that framework is when you're single, your relationship is holy with the Lord. And just like if you were having a relationship with an act, with a human being, right. you got to make sacrifices. Yeah. Well, I, I can't pull doubles no more because my lady want to go out on the weekends. I can't be, you know, so engrossed with my clients because the guy that I'm dating wants to take me out. It's the same thing with the Lord. The Lord wants his time. So it could be a sacrifice in income. It could be a sacrifice in whatever your extracurriculars are. So now you can't watch Netflix for four hours at night because you you work during the day. Study time got to come from somewhere. Everything is I got to prioritize my time and sacrifice to make sure that I am giving the Lord his due. Because it, it literally says present your, your bodies as a living sacrifice. That is our responsibility as single individuals and as married individuals. We got to balance. We got to balance that. We got to play, too. Nobody gets to be like, Lord, I catch you on the back burner. Right. This was a good convo. All right. Too All right. Much. Everybody good. And to Eli's message, I know single a single person who adopted twins. That's crazy. That's crazy. I'm sorry. That's crazy. And I was actually reading um, a report two weeks ago. That is basically now folks are fin finally acknowledging and calling the, the, the persistent single parent issue in America an epidemic because they finally can, they have data to look back. It was something like 75% of men, especially black and Hispanic men in jail, came from single mother households. When you look at the largest cause, of homelessness in teenagers, low income, um, dropout rates. A lot of this is tied to single parenting. 
And it just compounds what we now understand of scripture is single parenting, having babies out of wedlock, not covered under the covenant of marriage is outside the will of God. And when you are outside the will of God, chaos reigns and you have generations of people's lives ruined because they were raised in a single parent household. Not saying that all single parents are terrible parents and their children going to go to jail, be homeless and drop out of school. No. But what the data is showing is the vast majority of them, that's what happens. So a single person trying to raise two by themselves and work and cook and, 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 that is crazy. Because, yeah, I, me and FTR got two at the house, and it's two of us, and it feel like it's nine of them, which is <laughs> two. <laughs> like, where are they coming from? So, yeah, I would not advise that. And I don't think any person who sought the Lord as a single person, I'm confident in saying the Lord would not be like, yeah, I want you to adopt multiple kids by yourself. Because that just, that's, no. Like, we, yeah. That's outside of his design. And it's extremely yeah. difficult to raise a child. Unless you got a trust fund, you ain't got to work, <laughs> yeah. you just got money, and you just want to take care of kids outside of that. Mm. And then that did, oh, oh, open an orphanage, hire a staff, like do, like, do it that way. <laughs> but yeah, all right. Uh, any last minute thoughts, questions, comments before we close? Yeah, questions at the end. Okay, cool. Um, Lord, we just thank you for yet another awesome discussion. Um, that it was clearly needed and necessary uh, and timely um, for the environment that we are currently in and living in today. Lord, we are just grateful for the revelation that you have given us and all the questions and, um, that have brought forth to even grow our knowledge and understanding of this concept in your word. Lord, I pray right now that everyone under the sound of my voice would have a blessed day, that we enjoy the rest of the weekend, and that would be rested and rejuvenated for us to start a week on Monday. And we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.